uh, welcome back. Uh, TTV5, the Tone Dome episode 5. Uh, Brandon here in uh, Montreal, Quebec, Sam across the border in uh, Florida. And we're uh, very honored to be uh, joined by two very special guests today. Uh, Mr. Steve Lang from Boston Symphony and Mr. Colin Williams from the New York Philharmonic. Uh, gentlemen, how are you? Great. Doing very well. Thanks awesome. for having us. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, before we dive right into it, I believe Sam has a small, uh, small warm up that he'd like to uh, uh, give you guys, uh, all pun intended. So uh, I'll uh, hand off <laughs> the tones. mic over to him and <laughs> I'll give him the mic and he can uh, take it away. Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, create something a little fun to get it all, us all warmed up and everything. Um, I wanted to, first of all, this... This story is not rooted in uh, any reality at all, but I created a Mad Lib that we're going to fill out together, and uh, you guys are going <laughs> to come up with the, the uh, words, and we're going to read a story, and it's going to be something interesting. I, it's, it has a little something to do with the fact that I studied with Steve and will study with you, Colin, uh, in the fall, so I'm looking forward to studying with you, Colin, and Steve... Thank you so much for everything that you've done. That's how I'll preface it, so nobody gets any uh, <laughs> oh, great. offended or anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So we're just gonna. I'm just gonna read you what what I have, and then we'll fill it out together, and we'll see what what happens with it. All right. So let's start, I guess, with uh, Steve. A, an emotional state ending with L Y. Melancholy. <laughs> Melancholy. <laughs> Melancholy. Yes, Melancholy. and as uh, and the who who was it that said melancholy? What movie was that from? That was from. Oh, that was a Will Ferrell quote. <laughs> yes, I believe. Melancholy. Okay. Melancholy. I like that's good. Good start. All right, a positive adjective from you, Colin. A positive adjective. Just about like anything. This is just sort of like. A... Yeah. Sure. Hmm. Does it have to be? No, it's an adjective. So it's a positive adjective. So it's like, I keep thinking about like some adverbs here, but you're just talking about like, like, like pretty good or great or pretty, pretty. <laughs> great. There we go. Is that a compliment? That's yeah, because you're looking at me. That's of course because right? I'm looking at you. <laughs> yeah, I know. I bring out the best in you. Uh... All right, Steve, what is your favorite or yeah, what is your favorite vice? Oh, <laughs> Brisket. In, <laughs> <laughs> you know, copious amounts, of course. Copious amounts of brisket. <laughs> I, can, I can put that too, okay. Sounds good. Although I don't think that's the vice that you were thinking of. <laughs> um, it works. No, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. yeah. Trying to think. You gonna, you're going to rescind the brisket. I'm thinking that? about it. <laughs> well, it depends who's watching this. Um, yeah, let's see. Let's try. Yeah, let's just leave it at leave it at brisket for now. Let's let's okay. do that. Brisket is wholesome. It's still kind of a vice. It's it's <laughs> yeah yeah it's. <laughs> we, I think we just got some brisket the other day. Stand that it's definitely. I have a problem. <laughs> Barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. All right, Colin, for you, a trombone Facebook group name. The Tone Dome. The Tone Dome. <laughs> Great. Not okay. to be confused with the Chrome Dome. <laughs> yes. There you go. You're welcome. I like it. The lighting is perfect, Steve. It's really perfect. <laughs> All right, from you, Steve, a trombone manufacturer. Getson. Okay. Nice. All right, I, uh, Colin, from you, a peer at Juilliard that's not Steve. A peer at Juilliard who's not Steve. Ah. It's going to have to be Craig then. Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay, uh, Steve, a, a piece or part of your trombone, like... Uh, 
You know what I mean? Like the name of something. Oh, yeah, we got to go with the spit valve. Spit valve. <laughs> <Those are great. laughs> okay, another adjective with L-Y, Colin. Uh, let me think about this. Sloppily. Well, that's not an adjective, but it's more of like an adverb. It works. That works. Oh, okay. Works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a synonym of big, Steve. Um, huge. Huge. Y-U-G-E. Huge. huge. Without the H. Huge. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, uh, Colin, a negative adjective this time. Oh, you're getting all the adjectives. I know. God, it's, it's a <laughs> negative adjective. Let me think about that one. So, um, so just, yeah, atrocious. How about that? Atrocious. Yeah. All right. Uh, another trombone manufacturer, Steve. <laughs> God, there's so many to choose from. So many good ones, too. Um, I'm going to go with Edwards. Okay. <laughs> Staying on brand. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, it was great. Uh, I need an onomatopoeia now. Like a, a word that represents Kaboom. a sound. Kaboom. Right. That's a good one. All right, Steve, I want you to describe... Alessi's teaching style in one word. <sighs> Flood of emotions are coming over me. <laughs> and to pick one word, very difficult. Uh, thorough. Thorough. A powerful emotion, Colin. Hmm. Like, is it positive, negative? Doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, how about euphoria? <laughs> <laughs> Steve, how many mouthpieces do you own? Do you want me to go check? I, I, I no, don't. don't check. Don't <laughs> just don't. a guess. Just, I don't. <laughs> Well, and that's that's different because I, how many do I actually own or actually do I have in my possession or, that's different. No, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd say probably fifty. Fifty. Okay. All right, and Colin, a tonguing technique. Uh, triple tonguing. Triple. <laughs> <laughs> And Steve, a song that just makes you want to move, like dance. Uh, a song that makes me want to move. Oh, this is a this is so stupid. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, no, what just came to I'm going to go with what just came to mind. Great. Which is the Macarena, and I have no idea why it just came <laughs> to mind. It, I, I, I have you mean, been to a wedding lately, or what? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, oh, oh, that, that I could have said some other things. Now let's just leave it at the Macarena for now. Sounds good. Why so, not? Why not? The story is complete. Now. All right. <laughs> so we're gonna see how this goes. I'll see if I can read it in a interesting way. We'll see. All right. <laughs> so I title this uh, story "Elephant in the Room." All right. It began with a kidnapping. Saint Stephan of Babylon, a popular philosopher, had melancholily snatched his previous student, Samus, away from his new teacher, Master Cullen of Atlantis, to stay <laughs> under his self-proclaimed pretty tutelage. After all, Samus had introduced him to copious amounts of brisket, changing Saint Stephan's life forever. The first of Atlantis, Jolesi, caught wind of the stolen student and sent the guard of the Tone Dome to retrieve Samus, his kidnapper, and the student's new teacher, Master Cullen. Once summoned, they would be tried by the king himself in the court of Getson. Once the two <laughs> masters and student were assembled before him, King Jalesi, King Jalesi's servant, Craig, announces <laughs> to the court, by decree of the king, 
The pupil dilemma will be resolved as follows. If a consensus regarding the permanent mentorship of this most promising student cannot be reached, Samus will be cut in two with a spit valve and divvied <laughs> evenly betwixt both masters. Both St. Stephen and Master Cullen contemplated sloppily, as any <laughs> esteemed philosophers would, and voiced their decisions. St. Stephen of Babylon, apparently mesmerized by Samus's previous displays of huge aptitude, <laughs> announced, I wish to resolve the dilemma by dividing the student into two equal parts so I might still extract half of what he has to offer and share him with my esteemed colleague. Master Cullen of Atlantis, stunned by his fellow philosopher and old friend's atrocious resolution, proclaimed fearfully, <laughs> then you will take him whole, my friend. The survival of this most valuable student is of paramount importance. To this, <laughs> King Jalesi slams down his Edward's gavel with a kaboom. <laughs> he declares, for Master Cullen's understanding of the sanctity of the pupil's life, he will be deemed permanent mentor of the budding student, Samus. He then turns his thorough gaze to the saint. For your unfortunately unenlightened resolution, Saint Stephan, states the king, you will be banished from the great city of Atlantis for 50 years to the city of brotherly euphoria to be ruled by the tyrant Tobias of Babylon. <laughs> the, <laughs> the devastated Saint Stephan tripled over in pain with the thought while Master Cullen and Samus celebrated by dancing to the Macarena as they returned to life in the heavenly city of Atlantis. The end. Good job, guys. I'm ashamed of you, wow. Steve, that you would, you would try to go that route. <laughs> Dividing the baby. Come on now. Nice. Well, that was, that was it. And you guys, I'm going to send both of you guys that. And uh, Oh, yeah. That's frameable maybe. right there. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was more of a warm-up for me i feel nice. <laughs> anyway we can get get right into the questions now brandon if you if you would like yeah sure colin awesome. you're gonna you're you're gonna have a lot of fun next year <laughs> i can tell <laughs> I'll, i gotta get my mad libs game up a little bit i'm a little rusty <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was nice. great. They were all great answers. It worked. The yeah, story worked. flowed. Yeah. Yeah. It was like Melancholy. 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 Okay. That's funny. Uh, all right. All right. So I guess right off the bat, we're we're all still at home. Orchestras are uh, now canceling into their. Uh, uh, fall season, some the entire season, as we discussed before uh, we went on here. So, uh, what are both of you doing to uh, pass the time? I guess uh, how are you keeping busy, uh, staying in shape, uh, playing wise? And uh, if you'd like, what's uh, one unexpected, uh, uh, unexpected, I should say, uh, positive that you found with this uh, ongoing uh, quarantine? You want to go first, Colin? Yeah, sure. Um, so. In terms of like trying to stay in shape on the trombone, you know, I've, I've sort of gotten into the habit of, of divvying up my day into, you know, two lo sort of large ish sessions. So it's about all I can seem to manage between the, the child care and the committee work and that kind of thing. Um, you know, my, my normal sort of routine in the morning is, is pretty consistent, it takes like an hour, hour and 10, I sort of go through it at a, you know, leisurely pace, covers all the, the stuff that I consider to be sort of the, the fundamentals. Um, and then the, I'll have like an evening session where I'm going to try to work on, uh, if I don't have a specific goal for solos or something like that, I just find myself playing through a lot of different Bordonis and all these various transpositions because I feel that it's pretty efficient to just sort of keep my chops working. Um, as I've been trying to get ready for uh, some actual playing commitments, like for the Southeast Rumbo Symposium, that kind of thing, um, we have, I've been sort of transitioning that, that evening session over to sort of more solo playing and that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's essentially it. It, 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 doing the best you can. I'm in some ways I am more restricted in my ability to approach practicing during this quarantine 
because there are so many other responsibilities that that are uh, are present now. You know, the the full time childcare to a two year old and a four year old is a lot. You know, um, the the fact that we moved out of our place in New York and are basically, especially when the the pandemic was really cresting around the New York New Jersey area, we we decided it was it was better to leave. And we've been in Pennsylvania and are going to move back soon. Now that things have kind of calmed down, but uh, yeah, I mean, so I'm not even in my own home base. You know, I, I'm in the, the basement of my uh, in-laws' house, sheltering until the the everything had passed. So, you know, um, oh. I guess the positive thing is 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 spending more time with my with my children than I would have been able to spend otherwise, and all the ups and downs that go with it. You know, um, it's been it's been kind of awesome to be able to see them all the time in a way that I wouldn't have had a chance to if I was on my regular schedule. So that's the positive side. It's not necessarily music related, but to me, it's it's life related. And, and um, you know, as, as silver linings go, it's a pretty good one. Awesome. Great. Hmm. Yeah, I, Mr. yeah, for me, uh, for me, is a, a lot of what Collins just said applies here as well. Um, I mean, I'll start with the positives. The positives are, yes, a lot more, a lot more time with the family. Um, when the pandemic first hit, uh, I found myself sitting down with, uh, I, have, I have two kids. I have a 14-year-old and a 10-year-old. And the 10-year-old, who's, who's in fourth grade, just finished his fourth grade, we would sit down and, and do the homeschool every, every day. And um, the positives was, was getting to just, get right right up in there with how he learns and i learned so much about how he learns um and 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 what makes him tick uh things that i know i wouldn't have had the chance otherwise because i would have left it to the to, to his uh his teachers you know so that was really fun um other positives uh, you know just getting to know um getting to know bo both kids and then now i have the opportunity because we 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 aren't working at the moment uh, to coach my my oldest son's baseball team, and so uh, we are actually doing baseball outside, uh, socially distanced with masks and all that stuff. But but being able to to mentor uh, a group of you know 14 through 16 year old boys is uh, well young men really um, is just is just a trip. It's so much fun, and uh, but yeah, as far as uh, and obviously you know. I never used to watch TV, so I'm getting caught up on, on some some things um, in the middle of family Ozark, feud. which, yeah, yes, and Family <laughs> Feud. Yes, we were talking about that earlier, and so that's one. That's a family thing that we do. We watch Family Feud, and uh, which is a lot of fun. And um, but anyway, so yeah, do no, you get we're the having answers correct, Steve. Oh, like, what I always, of the time? yeah, okay. I always get I always get the the one answer that two people on the survey. Say, uh, that's the one usually I get, and um, you are the minority. I like, and it. then yeah, I, exactly, exactly. So, uh, but we have that happened last night several times, which was really funny when we were watching it. So yeah, Steve Harvey's hilarious. Uh, so yeah, but as far as trombone and all that's considered, I, it, it was a big push for us. Kind of as the as the season progressed and right as soon as the pandemic hit, we were doing lots of projects. We did a we did a whole orchestra project called Summon the Heroes, and um, you can check that out. It was really it was actually very difficult for me at the time because I had to figure out how to put all this technology together. Just Sam, as you know, after teaching you, we we were dealing all with all this stuff on how to teach online and stuff and. Mm -hmm. And so we were doing that and then Big I was shit. continuing. Yeah. And I was continuing working with, uh, uh, you know, different, different students just trying to, trying to get better, trying to learn more, um, you know, myself. And then, uh, these past couple of months I've been working on recording, um, some all state etudes, which will be released on the 19th for Texas. I was asked to do that by my former teacher, Joe Dixon, who, um, who who chose the 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 excerpts and had me play them and so so working those up gave me something to do and uh which was awesome and i loved it it was great and um and not only just working on you know becoming a better player through that experience but also uh 
you know, I haven't really recorded anything solo, solo wise, you know, for, for me, like, you know, like, uh, like Colin has, he embarked on a wonderful project that everyone should, should hear, uh, and his, and his recording. But, uh, so this was kind of a new thing for me. And I put the whole thing together with multi-cam, multi-camera angles and all that stuff. And it was, it was a, it was a real big deal for me. So that kept me going. And then, and then we had another project with our low brass quartet that we just, we went out to Tanglewood for, uh, last Friday. And that was the first time we'd ever played as a group since March. So that brought its own challenges in terms of endurance and all that stuff that I was tr trying to, you know, it's, it's, you know, if you're not working every day, you know, you can play in a room and practice and get, you know, get stuff done, but it's, it, it's really hard to replace. I found, uh, you know, the playing with playing with others. Yeah. But uh, as far as what I had to do is just, you know, I, as long as I had something to work for, I was doing my warm ups and I was doing I was trying, you know, trying to trying to get better, trying to record myself, those kinds of things. Sure. If, if we could if we could like look into the future, I guess, and with all of this technology and yeah. how things are moving, what do you guys foresee happening? Like, what what of this will stick around? What of what of it will go away? And as people kind of come back do you have any foresight or into what's going to happen i mean nobody really knows but i mean nobody nobody really knows i mean and it, i think it depends you know there there's a lot of of you know the technology is now getting to the point where there's a lot of interesting opportunities for individuals to get out there and make a name for themselves you know it, it's you can you know i think one of the pioneers for this one i always think about like christopher bill you know, and what he's been able to sort of get out there with him, like really early on pushing the envelope for doing the, the live multi-track recordings and creating these kinds of, of cool things and the very interesting yeah. content that he's created. But, you know, I think what people have seen is that they there is the there's room for a lot of more of more people out there in the marketplace to sort of present their own interesting content. And there's a lot of interested people out there, too. So I think that that learning how to sort of move in that digital space and learning how to collaborate in that digital space and learning how to create uh, compelling content is something that has really been pushed to the forefront of, of what everyone has to do these days. And um, I think that's important. You know, it, it's, that's how, um, you know, uh, increasingly people access music is, is electronically. So what can we do as uh, primarily acoustical instruments, you know, to sort of enter that space in a way that's, that's interesting and compelling. So I think that's been a positive development is, you know, that I've seen a lot of sort of creative and interesting uh, projects online and a lot of people who have, you know, done some recordings, um, you know, uh, just themselves, you know, multi-tracked over and, and that's great. The other thing that I, on the other side of that coin though, is, is when it comes to things, I, I think there's still, if this is showing us anything, even with all of that stuff, that is, that is not a, uh, a like a complete substitute for live performance. I think we have all um, felt that missing, you know, the ability to see live music and all of the stuff that's attendant to that, like to like getting together, getting like, you know, going out for a meal before going out for, you know, a, a drink afterwards or something like that. The whole ritual around getting together, going to experience something together live and then going out and talking about it afterwards is something I think we are all sorely missing. And so I think that's one thing that that has given me some hope. I don't have the the fear that now that we've had all this digital stuff presented that people are all of a sudden gonna stop going to concerts. If anything, I think people are gonna be more compelled to go out, you know, once once things are safe to experience this live stuff because I feel like we're all missing it. And, and I'll be honest, you know, for, even for myself, like I, I like a lot of these projects that I've seen but I've found that I'm watching them for shorter and shorter periods of time now, whereas I used to initially I was engaging and like sticking around for the whole thing. Uh, I honestly, I'm fatiguing on it in a way that I never fatigued in live for like going to live shows. So that's my sort of perspective. There's room in the digital sphere and I think it's great. And we're, we're pushing the envelope there and it's great for, for, uh, for that part of what we do. Um, but in a way, maybe this is going to make us respect and not, you know, take for granted the, the idea of going to a concert and everything that goes along with it. Yeah, I totally agree with that because, because, uh, you know, my, my wife, she works for a very, for a, a speakers series and they've been trying to figure out, well, what do we do? You know, and, uh, you know, we've got certain speakers who come to the hall or, well, you know, do they do it digitally? You know, well, what do the subscribers think? You know, and I think the secret sauce of that is that you get, you keep it live. Because, 
because when you go into a building and you see, and the this, this same goes for music too, but you, you go into a building and you see that speaker, you know, it could be someone really famous. You have a connection with that person because you're in the same building. You have a connection there that you just can't really totally get online. And uh, so I, I, I completely agree with, with Colin. I'm not worried. I think people, you know, like we've learned, we've learned a tremendous amount of what's possible. Um, and, uh, you know, but when it comes down to it, I think people are just cannot wait to come back and, and have that, you know, food for the soul, uh, to, you know, and listening something live, you know, warts and all, uh, if there are any warts, because, because it, it's, there, there's a connection, there's a communication that happens and it's, it's really important. Now, having said that teaching wise, I think maybe you were, you were alluding to that. I think there's so much that I want to continue with the things that we've learned moving forward once we get back to uh, maybe a normal one-on-one, -on -one, you know, um, uh, lesson environment. <clears throat> because I think I think the, uh, what what I discovered through teaching online and the way that the way that we we experienced uh, some some ways to um, you know to work work through these recordings and you know you meet online a little bit but you send a recording i i think i think there's so there was so much um a value that came from it and i definitely will be continuing some of the uh, uh some of the things that we learned throughout these past couple of months going forward what do you think a good tool is i mean like for the people watching if they want to try something new out do you recommend some uh technological tool that that you weren't privy to before this experience? I think a good one, honestly, if you just want to get started with like, even just understanding like how to work with multi-track and the most basic kind of thing, just to get a little, to dip your toe in. I mean, acapella was something I hadn't really played with before at all, you know, and I, a few early on, I kind of got in there. Um, uh, I had intended to, to get much more into more complicated kinds of stuff, but I, other things I'm doing kind of got in the way of that, but it, I always feel like that's like if you're curious about what's even cap what you're what's even possible, but you don't want to make a big investment in technology or or have to work too too hard. I feel like acapella is a good way to, to start. Sure. I think I think most people have all the technology that they that they need, mm -hmm. and I think you know uh, because of the situation that we've we've been in, a lot of people are like oh. I didn't know I could use that recorder as an audio interface. What's an audio interface? Like, how do I, how do I make that work with my computer? Um, you know, oh, GarageBand can do that, you know, or um, Audacity can do that. Really? Oh, I had this all along and I didn't know how to use it. So, uh, so I think a lot of, a lot of folks and a lot of people watching this podcast who are, you know, maybe trombone players, you know, trying to get better and they're like, oh, I can, I can use that. Well, it's kind of like, you know, you know, what they tell you, you know, look into a mirror and, you know, look at your embouchure in a mirror. Well, wh but, but that's fine. Everyone has a mirror, but what exactly are you looking for? So the same thing applies here. You've got, you've got all the technology, but how do you use it? And so once you, you know, until it, until it was necessary to use it for specific purposes, now a lot of people are becoming more and more aware of how you can use it. You know, for example, one of the things that we did in, in our in our lesson, Sam, is is, mm -hmm. you know, we we you know, you had two tracks. You had one with the with the drone and, and you played a melody over on top of it and then you recorded yourself and you could hear you hear you hear everything. You hear exactly what's going on. You hear that. And, and when you hear it, you can hear what's in tune. You can hear what's not in tune. You can hear your right. phrasing. You can hear all sorts of stuff. And, um, you know, we've, I think we've all been preaching, Hey, you got to record yourself, you know, all these, all this time, but it's like, it, I, I think sometimes these processes have, have come down to us like, well, yeah, but how do I really get in there? How can I get really detail oriented? And, um, so I think that's been a positive throughout all of this. Sure. Great. Uh, if, if you don't mind me going back to, uh, the topic of concerts, uh, I'm curious to get both of your opinions on how you see orchestras uh, slowly starting to come back to reality, if you will. Uh, I, I feel like, although it would be great, uh, I, I feel like out of, uh, you know, three, four thousand people in the concert hall, there's going to be one person who uh, refuses to take a vaccine or treatment for this thing. 
Uh, so do, do you see concert halls doing some, some form of uh, temperature check before concerts or uh, some form of new rule in the future? Uh, yeah, feel free to... Uh, well, say your thoughts. Thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, logistically, this is something that that's being dealt with on, on a number of different levels, because, as you say, there, there's going to have to be some different kinds of protocols, especially early on and in, in absence of a, uh, a, a uh, effective vaccine to keep people socially distanced and to try to um, uh, do your best to screen for people who may be potentially, you know, um, uh, carrying the covid virus. So. Um, if you look at some documents that have been produced, you're talking about, yeah, the initial temperature check. And if someone has a fever, what do you do with them? You know, you have to be able to, to control ingress and egress from the hall in a way that's socially distanced. Um, you're going to have other little, like, you know, uh, mundane things like no valet parking, you know, is going to be available because of the interaction that would have to happen with that. Um, seating is probably most likely going to be family unit seating together only with, you know, whatever the prescribed distance is in between those, um, which means that a hall is going to have their capacity reduced anywhere from, you know, 60 to 75 percent, depending on how the seating uh, charts are. You're going to have to control the ingress and egress of all the musicians, you know, to keep them socially distanced. You're going to have to control how musicians um, are wearing masks uh, during rehearsal. If you're a wind or brass player, you're going to have to, you know, do what you do normally at a socially distanced kind of thing. But if you need to talk to each other during the rehearsal, you have to be able to put your mask back on. You have to have some place to dispose of your of this everything that comes out of the spit valve. You know, um, you're going to there's still ongoing studies as to how much the aerosols aerosolization of, you know, just off the corner of your embouchure or something like that. Is that going to project enough viral particles? What is the viral load that that, you know, causes infection that, there's a lot of unknowns. So essentially, I think when it comes back to normal, it's going to come down to really strong uh, health protocols that are prescribed by, you know, whoever the not only, you know, the epidemiologist, but like, you know, someone who's going to be like a, a, a like a, a workplace, like uh, health safety kind of person. I know there's a technical term for it for someone who like helps to, to determine how to disinfect a workspace. It's just escaping me right now. Um, so those two are going to have to be coordinated. And then a lot of it is going to have to be based on your local community, because in the absence of any kind of national policy towards this uh, virus, we're going, everything is going to be local, you know, and um, yeah, and that's, that's a little bit of a variable. And people are just going to have to get used to wearing masks too, because otherwise you're not going to go out and do anything. So, I mean, that's, there's no, there's no, there's no real straight ahead answer on this one. We can start to come back in areas where the viral load has been brought down, you know, um, but in, cautiously and with the, the, you know, whatever, whatever the uh, municipal authorities say, you know, and, and I think all of this is to say that, that in the United States anyway, there's not going to be anything that resembles normal concertizing on a nationwide scale anytime in the near future. Cause we're just, we're just not doing it. We're not, we're not capable of doing it in this country. I don't know what else to say about that. Yeah. Coming from Florida, I totally agree. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Florida It's really rough down here right yeah. now. I mean, I, opening I, Disney I in the middle of that in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. In the Northeast, we might be able to do some things, but it's still going to be t very tightly scripted, you know, but it's, yeah. it's just tough. Yeah. We've been talking about uh, trying to, figure out a way to get tested every day in terms of the musicians so mm -hmm. that we can do something. Um, you know, I, we still don't know. It, it seems like the information is changing daily, See, you know, and, you know, you look at the numbers today on, I don't know, what is today? I've lost track. The 15th of July, you know, you look at, you look, you look at the map and go, okay, well, Massachusetts seems to be doing okay. Um, and that's great. But, you know, where I teach at the New England Conservatory, I don't think there are very many Massachusetts, uh, you know, n natives coming to study there. They're, they're coming from everywhere else, yeah. uh, all over the world. And, and we have got students who can't get visas because the embassies are closed, you know. And uh, but but those who are coming, those who are able to come. You know, we don't know we don't know where they're coming from. And, you know, it, there, there's so many things that we don't we don't know. But but I, I there's probably going to be some sort of some sort of spike that happens in the fall. So that's my opinion. I, I'm guessing it, it could. I hope it doesn't. Uh, but, yeah, I think every, everything that Colin mentioned is just there's just so many what ifs and unknowns. And I've been talking to the 
the high school band director here, he's trying to figure out what to do with school. All schools are trying to figure out what to do, you know, and it's, we're all kind of in the same boat. I don't know, but uh, I suspect that um, up, up here in the Northeast, you know, maybe Colin, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what you guys are doing in, with the Philharmonic, but, but my guess is that hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do, you know, chamber groups you know maybe maybe mm. maybe not completely shut down hopefully and just do something because i think it's important also that that the musicians are are, are doing something in a safe way socially distanced way uh you know following as much of the protocol as we can and uh, gosh just just hope that hope that we've got you know vaccines available uh, or uh or drugs available in case that, that will help lessen the symptoms uh, should one of us get it. I mean, we are beginning to put together some very like dipping our toe into the, the pool yeah. of live performances again and, and being able to do some yeah. certain things. And there is a ramp up that we have sort of charted out at the Philharmonic. Um, but it's all voluntary. There's nothing, uh, yeah. there's nothing compulsory at this point. Um, but I think there's also an appetite for it. even within the musicians that if we can do this in a safe way, we want to do it. Um, right. so, uh, it's, but yeah, it's, it's, you have to be extremely cautious. You have to be extremely cautious. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We'll see. That's the moral <laughs> of the story. <laughs> we'll see basically. Sadly. Uh, so, so I, Oh yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, buddy. Um, I, I, I just wanted to change the mood a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Kind yeah of, too. Kind <laughs> of, <laughs> the, the vibe came down a bit. I think we could bring it back up. I, we yeah. want to know your history like with each other i mean the the whole point of this interview is (laughs) like having both of you on is just an interesting dynamic but also you guys have a relationship so if you could start from the beginning maybe it's a very some it's a very special relationship (laughs) um goes back a ways we we go back well it's not that far is it sadly it is now it it kind of is i had more hair (laughs) i'll tell you that um, well, okay. It was, uh, fall of 1997 that there were three trombone players, uh, admitted to Juilliard and that's where we met. Uh, the other, the other, uh, student was Craig Mulcahy and, um, yeah, so it was just the three of us admitted there. Uh, and that's where, that's where we met you. I believe Colin, you had spent a couple years at the Manhattan school, right? Yeah. I did two right? years at MSM and was transferring. In yeah. There. So you're transferring in, and and I came from IU. Uh, I'd done five years at Indiana because I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do there, and um, and then Craig came from University of Colorado Greeley. I think I think that's where he that's where he came from, and so um, yeah. I mean, actually, actually, I hadn't. I knew I didn't know you very well, and Craig co- contacted me through email and immediately just said, Hey, do you want to, do you want a room with me, uh, in New York? And I was like, I don't know who you are. You know, of course now if I had known that I would have done that, it would have been hilarious. Uh, but, um, but <laughs> so I stayed in the, I stayed in the dorm and I think you were where, I can't remember where you were, Colin, you were up there. Anyway, we, we got to know each other. It doesn't matter. We, we got to know each other through, through those, those two, those couple of years. Um, you mean yeah? At the time I was I wasn't staying in the dorms. I was I was in uh, where I I stayed in the apartment I was living in at Manhattan School of Music in between uh, on Broadway in between LaSalle and Tiemann, you know, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. a very different area back then than it was than it is now. Actually, every time I, I when I started teaching at MSM, I was like, man, this is nice now. They got like good restaurants and stuff, and <laughs> they don't have Raoul's hair supply, which is go in there and that was like you know was not exactly some place that you bought shampoo. It was really there for another reason and it got shut down pretty quickly <laughs> by the police um like the first couple of months that i lived there i was like that was a it was a different place back then um but one of the things that was really interesting for me is that you know I, gosh I, I i i didn't have like the easiest time when i was in school i was really kind of up and down i didn't really uh, had a hard time like really trying to figure out like who i was I, and you know i was really really major confidence issues Um, and one thing that I think was really, uh, great about, um, you know, getting to know Steve and getting to know some of the other people in the studio is they felt, you know, um, they were a lot more sort of, um, whether or not they felt this way, 
to me, they seemed much more sort of like even keeled and a little bit stronger and, and, and role models that I could kind of lo like look to in terms of just how to like proceed and carry myself kind of thing. And whereas I was just, um, you know, a basket case a lot of the times, you know, I, I would look at, at the way that they were carrying themselves and I would, I would, you know, secretly aspire to trying to, you know, comport myself a little bit more that way. Um, you know, aside from just the, the obvious, you know, hearing them play and, and being motivated slash terrified because of how great they sounded. Um, it was, it was also a matter of, of just trying to, to learn from, uh, from their maturity, you know, um, and sometimes from their immaturity, you learn both because they were hilarious when you got like Steve and Craig together. Oh my God, I could not stop laughing. It was ridiculous. You know, it was awesome. So really it, it was, it was great because as someone who felt, you know, not, not really knowing, um, a lot about myself and still trying to figure it out. It was great to be around those guys because, you know, I think they provided such excellent, uh, role models and, and excellent colleagues during the whole time I was there. So it was an amazing important part of my uh education of course but even just as my you know personal development i think one of the things that um that i learned while i was there at juilliard i remember i was about to come in wondering did i did i deserve a spot at juilliard did i deserve that spot you know um and i remember getting there and it was really easy to be intimidated by everyone there and i and i was that's how i felt and um because I I'd listened to, to Colin and go, oh my God, what he he oh man, this 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 guy, this guy's you know playing circles around everyone regardless of how you felt, Colin. I didn't I didn't actually know that you felt that way, because uh, I I certainly didn't see you that way. I I, I saw you very very differently, um, and so I guess I guess just hearing this, I you know if if other people are watching this. Um, going i'm sure people are of course but you know when you when you get into when you get into sorry when you get when you get into your school and i remember i remember my one of my teachers telling me is like hey listen you're going to go to iu this is my teacher joe dixon he's like when you go to iu you're going to hear some amazing players really amazing players don't let it get you you know don't don't give up you know you'll be one of them when you get older and um and, and I was like, okay, you know, listen, I'm just going to go and just have fun. I, you know, this isn't, so that's what I tried to do when I got to, to, to Juilliard. And, and it wasn't just, you know, Colin and, and Craig, but it was the whole studio that you can't, what I, what I really learned was that, you know, I wasn't by myself. I wasn't alone. We needed each other. And, um, you know, it's one of the things that I try to tell my students and I've told, I know, Sam, I've told you this, that you can't do this alone. You can't, you, you can't. And so uh, you have to, you have to rely on your studio mates, you know, if it's support or if it's quartets or it's just getting together after, after a hard rehearsal or, you know, you know, it's going to get a bite to eat or whatever, you know, you, you got to have that. And, uh, you know, I had that with Colin. I had that with Craig and, you know, and some of the other folks that were there. And it didn't matter how old they were. There were some of the younger, younger students there that, you know, we had great conversations and, you know, it was, it was, it was a great thing. And I look back on my time there very fondly because of that, you know, sure. There were tough times. <laughs> there were, there were really hard times, you know, and you go through these, you know, ups and downs. And just when you think you figured it out, like something else will hit you and you're like, and, and if you feel like you've taken, you know, 10 steps backwards, but you know, you're not going to jump off, you know, you just jumped off the highway for a little bit. You, you're, you're still this far along. And I think uh, that's what I had to learn is just get back on the highway, you know, and keep going. And, uh, and the other thing I learned about it, about being there was that I didn't want to have any regrets afterwards. Uh, so I was going to, you know, whatever those two years were going to be, I was going to learn something from it, no matter if I was going to become a professional trombone player or not. And uh, so I was glad I went through that and I'm very, very glad to uh, to have had special people in my life, such as, you know, you, Colin and 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 Craig. And, you know, we're all still really good friends. You know, it's it, we 
you know, we did we did some amazing things while we were there, uh, trombone choirs, and you know, we went to you know various competitions and whatnot, and we really bonded. And I think I think that's what was very special about about that about the time that we were there. And I'm sure other folks, you know, uh, who are at different schools and whatnot, whatnot have that same kind of feeling. And it wasn't really any different at, at Juilliard. It was just, we just had a, we just had a great time and we were all there to help each other. And that, that's, that's what I remember from that. Great. And uh, throughout your studies, did both of you, just out of curiosity, uh, while you were auditioning uh, for auditions and everything, did you have the, goal in your mind of uh, I'm going to be playing in Boston Symphony, I'm going to be playing in the New York Philharmonic, and uh, <laughs> if so, how, how did that help uh, with your growth as a trombone player? Well, I knew that I knew that Colin would eventually be in the New York Philharmonic. I mean, I, I mean, we had we had talked about this. I didn't know a long time. I, well, I did. I knew that he would be there. Uh, me, I forgot. I don't know. You know, I just I, I don't. I, you know what? I don't. I don't want to speak for you, Colin, but I just, I just, I just believed in you so much, and uh, I just knew that you would be, you would be a great success story. And shoot, you even, uh, you even played with the Philharmonic when you were a student there. So I mean, to see, to see that, and to see, you know, I mean, I was, you know, maybe a couple years younger uh, than me, but I was really looking up to you, and 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 I remember, I remember. Uh, uh, you know, asking you, you know, how do you do this? What are you doing? You know, I, how did you get up to that high register? You know, how do you, how do you have that low register? I mean, I was always asking you those questions. Um, and so, you know, you were very, you were very, help, very helpful to me. But anyway, I always knew that you'd be in the New York Philharmonic. Uh, we thought that, well, there was, there was a series of positions that were going to be opening. I was like, yep, that's, that's, that's going to be you. That's going to be you, Colin. And so sh sure enough, it d didn't happen quite like that, but you got there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty funny. It's pretty funny for me. I don't. I don't. I did not. I, I. I had no idea. I just. I just wanted to just think in the present and, uh, you know, continue to get better and let the. And I trust. I trusted that if I did everything the way I was supposed to do, something something good would happen from it. So that that's the way I looked at it. No way would I have realized I would have been in the Boston Symphony or the St. Louis Symphony or, you know. I and and actually. Um, one thing that I don't know if you guys know this, but our first job together was together in the San Antonio Symphony. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when we, uh, you know, we were able to finally put it together and we both did a good enough job that we got a job in the San Antonio Symphony. And that was that was a dream come true uh, <laughs> to play professionally with with uh, with Colin uh, after uh, and after I left that year. I, I, that year, I got a job in the St. Louis Symphony, um, where my wife is from, and I remember thinking, "Man, I, I don't know. I, I this is going to be really tough to leave Colin here because you know we had we had a good thing going. You know, we we were just out of school, and we we'd had the same teacher. We knew exactly what we wanted to do because it was fresh out of school, and you know all the all those all the little things that we had been taught. We were automatically doing them." Um, and it took up until just a few years ago for us to share the stage again when uh, Colin invited me to play in the New York Philharmonic for, uh, uh, for, for a week. We did some Wagner, and that, that, was, that was super fun. And then Colin Harvard. came to, to Boston, and we, we, did, uh, we did the... Um, oh, oh, play some Janacek. Played, yeah. Yeah, the Janacek, the Janacek, <laughs> Sinfonietta. Sorry. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, it's, 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 super, it's super fun. It's, just, it's, been a, it's, been a, it's been a cool story. You know, it's funny in school, I, I, you know, the New York Philharmonic, Boston Symphony, all that stuff was just aspirational, but I honestly didn't yeah. really see a path to get there. You know, it's like, I remember thinking to myself, it's like, well, let me just see if I can start by, you know, seeing if I can make a living with this thing to start with, you know, and then once I got yeah. the job, it's like, okay, can I move to, a, you know, it's like, once I figured out, first of all, it wasn't like I got there and it's like, oh, I can leave again. It's like, I realized, especially going in and playing principal, I was like, I don't know anything. I, I think I need to like figure some stuff out here. Um, but once I felt a little more comfortable, like uh, it's like, okay, so what, what else can I do with this? Where else can I go? Where else can I audition? You know? Um, and it wasn't necessarily because I felt super compelled to leave, but it, it felt like it was a challenge and, and it was, it was a way to see if I could improve myself, you know? So, so the timeline for us was, was for, for Steve and I, we both, um, 
I guess this was in 1999 that that San Antonio Symphony audition was, and they had they had two openings, and they just were in the position where they took the two of us at the same time to fill the position together. You know, and so that was, first of all, like kind of amazing, you know, to be able to start in a new job where you actually knew someone already that you could sort of like <laughs> yeah, have they could have each other's back um, in a completely <laughs> different place. too. That's yeah, awesome. I know. It's really, really crazy. <laughs> um, and then you didn't like uh, to wear shorts either. You know, it was San Antonio <laughs> and, you know, here you were. It was 115 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> and you were just like coming in, you know. Yeah, I, know. I, I got there. That's I got so there. Funny. I got there. I didn't know a lot, man. I, I never had. I had never had barbecue. I didn't know anything. I didn't really know anything about Texas. I, you know, it's like I knew the Alamo, and that was about it. You know, when it came to, to San Antonio, um, I, it, I, I really so did fun. fall in love with that city, though, and, and and the orchestra and and playing there was such a great experience. Our first year there, you know, um, uh, Steve Demain was playing tuba. <laughs> eventually lee hip uh who plays tuba there now came back i mean just really great players great great people you know i met some of my very best friends in that orchestra who i continue to be friends with today i mean it, it was really just a, a, yeah. a great experience but in terms of like what did i ever see myself really playing in the new york philharmonic well i mean no I, I aspired to it but i didn't really see a path i had to like grow into that idea you know um and also for a while it, i didn't know if i would even keep playing trombone after I got injured. It took me a while to, to even embrace the idea, you know, now, you know, believing I could for a while and then believing I don't know if I could do, keep going at all. And then be, be able to come back and, and believe myself enough to audition again. That was, that was quite a journey too. So I, I think when it comes down to it, I think the way that Steve is talking about doing it is, is the best way you can have your aspirations, but really you got to believe in the work. You got to believe in the day to day. You got to just sort of take care of the day to day because that's, what's eventually going to get you there anyway. So if you can just trust yourself to do the work, if you can be diligent to do the work, if you can sort of have the friends who will help continue to maintain your inspiration and your, and your move forward, that's going to be the best way to get into a group that you want to play in. You know, it's going to be, that that effort of, of every day, you know, and not to get like too much too cheesy on it. But, you know, it's like, you know, the old proverb, you know, even the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I mean, that's what you got to keep track of is the small steps. You know, it's good to know what the goal is, but you don't always know the path there. The only thing you can really control is that next chunk. And you got to take that seriously and believe in it, because that is your whole world right there. What you decide to do with every day. Well, I think I think a lot of it is just, you know, your, your definition of success, you know, and and what is the definition of success? And, you know, I always like to go back and Sam, you remember this probably from your freshman year that you know, John Wooden, the, mm -hmm. the famous uh, basketball coach for the uh, uh, for UCLA. He won 10 championships in a span of 12 years. Uh, and he just said the definition of success is the peace of mind and the self-satisfaction of knowing that you did everything that you could do to become the best that you could be. And, uh, and so that's coming from within. And sometimes you don't, you don't know what, what that is until you really put yourself out there and you really try. Um, and so sometimes it comes down to, you know, just the amount of effort. Sometimes it comes down to let's work smarter sometimes, you know, and so, uh, you know, for, for, for me, uh, and I think what Colin's saying, you know, tr trust, Trust that, you know, if you're doing the, if you're doing what you should be doing every day, you know, something good's going to come of it. Hmm. That's all great. That's all great. Uh, if, if, if you don't mind me bringing up the, uh, the uh, man himself, Mr. Uh, Joe Alessi, how has uh, he, Who? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a teacher, how, how has he uh, uh, inspired you both? Uh, in your growth and development as a player? And do you find yourself using uh, similar uh, teaching strategies uh, from when you were studying at Juilliard with him? Oh, good, good, uh, good question. Uh, well, first of all, I wouldn't be here without, without Joe, that's for sure. Um, you know, just what, what an amazing, what an amazing man, amazing teacher. He's an amazing friend now. Um, and, and colleague, uh, yeah, lessons with, with him were fantastic. Uh, he, he just expected so much and he expected more than I thought I could give. And I think I learned, that's where I learned that I could, I could do more. 
you know, that I could think harder and I could think differently about this. Like I said, in that, that Mad Libs, he was very thorough. Mm. He was so thorough <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, uh, that I, I just didn't, I wasn't even aware. I wasn't even, I wasn't even thinking, but he, 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 it was, you know, and he, he got me to think, you know, mindfully too, you know, so that I, oh, okay, I need to be thinking about this. And um, how does it, tra now I can't teach the way he, he taught me. I'm, I'm sure a lot of, you know, maybe some some people, you know, who've taken lessons from me would say, oh, you know, I'm, I, I I don't think I could teach quite the way he could because he could just pick up his his instrument in, in lessons and just sound like a million bucks always, it seemed like um, to me. And that was very helpful for me at that time. Uh, you know, for, for me, I think it's not a good idea to just pick up my trombone. <laughs> After, oh, I disagree, after, Steve. After, oh, after, I don't think it's very helpful for me to do that. So, because then I and I start self evaluating. And it's like it's, it's not what it's about, you know. For, for me, but, but, uh, but it's yes, been incredibly no. helpful for me. <laughs> well, <laughs> just saying, I, that was that's. I think that's the hardest part about teaching is, you know, the decision to. Um, you know, if you can't get your point across, you know, do I pick up my instrument? Is this is this going to be a good idea or not? So uh, <laughs> anyway, that's that's uh, that that's that's what I struggle with. Um, but yes, no, Joe, Joe was just fantastic. And, um, you know, what a great you know, I'm just I'm just very fortunate and lucky to have been able to to, to work with him. Absolutely. You know, for for me, one thing that I thought was really, um, you know, uh, great about studying with Joe, um, you know, he, he, he thinks about it in a really specific way. So that even if you're with him for four years, it's not that long a period of time to get you really prepared for the world. So he tries to absolutely maximize your time together. And if that means that he has to be a little more, uh, apply more pressure, you know, push you harder. He's, he's, his way is, is, is to do that. And he has that capacity you know, through demonstration, through just sort of sheer force of will to sort of keep <laughs> applying that pressure to you. Um, and I can remember specifically, like he, he'll, he'll take you, make sure that you're staying on, on track. I mean, for me, uh, my first year there at, um, Juilliard, I, I had been in the city for a little while. I was starting to go do gigs, you know, I was starting to like, okay, I'll pick up a little bit of work here, a little bit of work there. I needed some money, but it was starting to be like, okay, I'm going out to New Haven. I'm getting back at like, you know, two in the morning from a poor game best show. And, and I have a lesson in the next morning and like, I'm not practicing as much as I should. And I'm tired. I'm like ridiculously exhausted all the time, you know? And, and he sort of took me aside at one of these points of times and like basically made me give up all of that outside stuff. The only thing I was allowed to do was, was school. And it was from there that I actually started to really improve because I could really wholly dedicate myself to what was expected of me. And I, and I think that, you know, I think that's something that, that, more of us should do as students, you know, is to, it's very tempting to get sidetracked by that immediate opportunity of like trying to build your brand, trying to build a gig here or there to do all these other things and to not take care of yourself in the, in, in the way that we really should in terms of attending to our own playing and, and the practice habits that we need to attend to our own, you know, areas that need improvement. And that's one thing that I, I, I really learned from him was that, to be single minded in that pursuit of perfecting my craft and there's no such thing as perfect, but it, it improving my craft to the absolute top of my uh, ability was really important. And especially in school, that's really your job. I mean, more than anything else is to take that as seriously as you can. There's time later on where you can start to balance your whole life, but your whole life in when you're a student should be about that. And I, that's one thing that I think I really learned from him was to, and that didn't mean just practice a lot of it, like listening. We, we used to have these like uh, listening parts where he'd bring in some recordings of ensembles that we would listen to that he thought were great. And, uh, you know, go see the Philharmonic play a lot. You know, these were things that he really expected you to do. And it was, it was very all encompassing of your life, but it really needed to be, you know? Um, and it's been an interesting journey for me to go from being Joe's student to being Joe's sort of like colleague from afar to like literally working in the same orchestra with him. And, and one thing I think is really amazing about Joe is that he really, you know, um, he, it's not like once you're a student that he's always just going to treat you like a student. Like if you're an adult, if you're his colleague, he treats you just like a great 
colleague and he's been just a great colleague to work with. I have, I have loved my time playing with him. I have just loved my time getting to know him better, you know, and I've loved being able to get into a routine, you know, and all just the, the, the sort of fun things that go along with being just a colleague in the brass room kind of stuff. And, and the, the, the ups and downs of, of just like getting through a season together. It's, it's a great thing. I mean, he's a really uh, particularly special player, special, special uh, mentor, uh, special colleague. And, and obviously, you know, it's, it's one thing I really f- find that that's great about him is that, you know, it's, it's just very normal now, you know, it's very cool. So, so uh, to ask again about Joe, I'm, um, you, you mentioned the pressure, the applied pressure, Steve, I, who, who broke first? I mean, out of you two, do you think you guys, um, did he break you or what, what, what do you think you would describe that experience as, I mean, you're, you're t- Colin, you're talking about having like eye opening experiences and things like that. But, uh, did you ever feel like he broke you down and I guess showed you the way or something like that, I guess. <laughs> this is the way. Um, <laughs> I almost wore my Mandalorian shirt. So. I know. <laughs> um, yeah, we've been, we've, been, we've been watching it too. Um, yeah. <laughs> another another uh, thing that has been fun to watch. Um, you know, you know, Colin. I don't know. I I remember. Um, I remember there were lessons I would get down about, and lessons I'd be upbeat about. And you know, part of part of studying with him was was trying to manage manage your own feelings throughout all this. Um, and the thing about Joe is that he, he, like I said before, he expected, it was, he expected so much it's, and you didn't want to let him down. And so when you came in, you know, first of all, I learned what, what to say and what not to say. And that, and I, I, that was, that was part of it. And so I was, I was, you know, uh, Sometimes I, I, I chatted up too much and then I was like, you know, oh, oh oops, sorry. You know, and, and sometimes, uh, <laughs> sometimes, uh, you know, he would get on me and, and it'd be like, oh, man, I, I just can't do this. And so so I wouldn't ever say that he broke me because I because I learned to expect more of myself. He taught me that. He taught me how to expect more from myself. So, so um, you know, and, and through through the whole experience, I remember thinking, you know, listen, he's te- it's, it's almost like he's teaching a version of of himself. It's just me. It's not it's not him. Like this is how he operated, so that he could become who who he is. And so I, you know, once once I realized that, it's like, all right, good, game on, let's do it. You know, and. Uh, and understanding that I could fail and it still would be a good learning opportunity. Um, you, you know, instead of, instead of like being afraid to fail, it's like, right, bring it on. I'm, I'm okay with the failure. Just, I want to learn from it. Um, and that's, that's what I learned from him. And, you know, and I learned to realize that it's, it's, it's okay. I'm trying to, I'm trying to become the best that I possibly can. And this is the, this is the course that, that I have chosen and it's, this is my choice. So I'm going to do everything I can during these two years to do everything he said. So, uh, and when it didn't work out, I already, I already knew it, you know? So, so usually I would, I would be very difficult on myself. I would be hard on myself. And so, uh, that's, that's kind of how, how that, how that worked. And the other thing I learned was that, uh, you know, my trombone playing should not define me as a person. It doesn't, it didn't, it didn't then, it doesn't now, it never will. Uh, it's something I do, not something that, you know, that, that defines me. So if I, if I mess up, then I had to relearn, okay, it, I don't need to be so hard on myself. Uh, so it's been kind of like a, a, a seesaw of, of how to, how to manage, manage that, uh, over, over the years. Um, and so, but I, but like I said before, you know, no way, no way I'd be here without, without his help. Uh, and I'm forever grateful, forever grateful. You know, I think one thing, uh, whether it's Joe or some of the other real like master pedagogues that are out there, one, one thing I, I kind of feel like in general is that the, the best teachers who are hard or demanding, but not mean, they're, they're basically, they're just, they're not asking any more of you than they ask of themselves. And I find that to be like the really an important key factor between someone who is 
um, you know, because we've all heard stories of abusive teachers and that kind of thing versus teachers who are just really trying to to get you to understand what it means to challenge yourself and to push yourself to to succeed. And that's one thing that I think that that Joe and, and some other you know teachers I, I've met before who but that's one thing that when people always ask about Joe, that's the thing I think of is that he's not asking you to do something that he doesn't expect of himself. You know, so if you are to study with him, it is to basically to put yourself into his realm of self expectation. And that's an intense place to live, you know? And so I think for, <laughs> you know, you've got to be ready for that. And I think that, that it, that takes a little bit of adjustment, you know, when you first go to study with him, but you, I don't ever feel, I, I never feel, you know, watching Joe teach or, and having, you know, been his, his student, his colleague, it never, it never ever feels personal in mean. It's like, this is just what he expects for himself. And he wants, you know, it, his, that's his commitment to you and your commitment to him. If you're a student is that, you know, you're going to live under that set of expectations. And um, I found it to be a, a really, uh, you know, enlightening experience, you know, it sort of changed my perception of what I, could be capable of. But something else that Steve said, I think is also equally important, you know, that the idea to not let the, the instrument, your identity, the last note that you play become you, you know, to not let the trombone subsume your identity as a person. And I can say that uh, personally speaking, that that's something that I think I got into a little bit in my sort of mid to late twenties is I really let the instrument, what was what I was doing on the instrument, my last note of the evening kind of thing became me. That was it. That was my entire self-worth was starting to get completely tied up with the execution of the trombone. Mm. And I think that that as as you go through your own sort of musical journeys with the with trombone or as a musician, I think it's really important to try to keep that in mind that you you can strive, you can push yourself, you can you can fail, but that's not who you are as a person, that you have more to offer as an individual than just the last thing that came out of the instrument. And, you know, uh, I think about all the times that I've reflected back on failures and sort of commiserated what I perceive to be failures and commiserated with people about it. And they don't remember any of that. And then when I think back to my own experience of, of listening to people and them telling me about things they were unsatisfied in their performances, it's like, I didn't really hear that. You know, I heard something completely different. So you ha I think you have to keep that in mind, too, as you go through the journey is to try to make sure that as you develop yourself as a musician, as a trombone player. But it's also equally important to try to keep track of who you are as an individual and as a person and to maintain that for your own, uh, you know, <laughs> mental and emotional health and personal growth. That's that's so important. Sure. Yep. Uh, now, uh, on continuing on the topic of uh, trombone as uh, the younger generation of, uh, of top tier trombone players, is there something in the trombone realm or, or the low brass realm, since we have a tuba player here, uh, that you're not seeing enough of or that you'd like to see more of in the future? Are you calling us young? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you, guys, you guys are like the young generation of the, yeah. the top tier trombonist, you know, so it's like if you could foresee I'll take what it. direction <laughs> <laughs> what direction this is going in. Hmm. I, I don't know, because when I look at when I look at, at the, the people who are younger than me who are winning auditions, you know, it's beautiful playing. It's 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 really you know, um, incredibly agile, beautiful playing, you know? Um, so I don't, I don't know that I have anything that, that from that quote unquote group that, that I would say is, is lacking. I, I look, I look, you know, to, to, um, you know, obviously the people that I looked up to and continue to look up to, you know, who have gone before me in his, as trombone players. But I also, I also look to the people who are just getting their career started and there's an enormous well of inspiration to draw from, you know? And, and I think that one thing that's really interesting is, is, um, you know, the fact that you have so much more access to more people now than when I was even, you know, getting into school, you know, the amount of, of stuff that's now on YouTube and available for recording and listening, it, 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 it's this entire huge, you know, breadth of, of uh, people to listen to. And, 
you know, in some ways, I think what's what's interesting is that for a while, because of limited recording availability, sound concepts kind of got funneled into a much more narrow kind of, of realm. And one thing I like listening to now is that there are there's more of a divergence in the way that people are choosing to approach the instruments. And I think that's healthy. I think one thing that's really about the the, the older past is that orchestras all used to have a really different sound and identity. And then we kind of got a little homogenized and we still we still do that to a certain degree. But I think as people's individual playing is is going out in different directions now that you're starting to hear more sort of takes on what you can do with the trombone. And I think that's great. I don't have much to add to that, quite frankly. Um, I'm, you know, in terms of inspiration, I, uh, when I have a chance and I, you know, I'm, and I'm on Facebook and I hear some of the younger players uh, put stuff out there, I think it's fantastic. And, you know, I mean, we're all, you know, we're all evolving. We're just, you know, we're going to, we're going to look back in time and go, yeah, we were, we were part of it at this particular time. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, just, but, but looking, you know, we're going to get inspiration from, you know, from the music and the music and the phrasing and, you know, what can, what can the trombone do, you know? And um, there's, there, there are going to be people who, who transcend, the trombone in, in certain ways. And I'm looking, I'm look that we don't even know about yet. You know, maybe, uh, you know, some high school kid right now, you know, is, is going to come through and, and just wow everyone and be like, and, and, and we, we hear about these people, you know, and, 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 uh, and it's fantastic, but, you know, um, so yes, I agree with, I agree with Colin about, you know, it's, it's inspiring for us to see. And, um, you know, and in the meantime, you know, we just keep, we just keep playing the trombone for the right reasons, which is to bring, you know, bring music to the public, you know, and nurture the soul, food for the soul, as, as uh, Andres Nelson's, our, our music director in Boston says, and, uh, you know, continue to, you know, it, it's, just, it's just something that we need to do and we need to share it. Um, that's how I feel about that. Hmm. Well, great. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, now, taking a totally different segue here, uh, Mr. Williams, you, you obviously went through uh, an injury uh, in the past. Uh, looking, at, just out of curiosity, looking at that now, is there anything that you, how do I word this? Is, is there anything that you know now that you would have done differently? And I guess on top of that, uh, for any younger players, uh, going through injuries, injuries right now or who may go through injuries in the future. Uh, any, how, how do you stay on task, focus, and uh, any words of advice? Ooh, that's a, that's a big one. Um, let, me, let me try to break that down because there's, yeah, there's a lot sure. in there. Um, so first of all, I think actually going back to something that Steve had alluded to earlier and one of the reasons that I stress its importance is trying to make sure that you don't let yourself be subsumed by what's coming out of the instrument. And I think that that is something that happened to me that led me down sort of an unhealthy, uh, obsessive relationship to practice and to evaluating my self-worth based on what was going on there. You know, um, I was practicing so much and and i think trying to push myself so hard that i was not really paying attention to what my body was telling me in terms of of general uh fatigue um i was practicing some things in a way that maybe weren't as mindful as they needed to be so i think i developed some bad habits and then i got a little bit of bad luck too because there are some people who can go ahead and go through a very obsessive uh place in practicing and you can kind of come out on the other side without having endured what i endured and so I think it's a combination of, of those things that sort of led me there, that, that, that uh, losing myself in the instrument and becoming sort of a, an obsessive practicer for the wrong reasons, uh, leading me to practice like the wrong things, um, too much physical, not enough, like really thinking about what I was trying to do with it. Um, this, uh, this idea that because I was practicing for the wrong reasons and not mindfully enough, I didn't keep track of some certain mechanical things. They kind of got away from me and got ingrained that left me more exposed to injury. And then the third thing is just like the bad luck, you know, that, that a little bit of, of all that is involved in there. So, um, again, just going back to, to, to what, uh, Steve was saying before, you know, really you owe it to yourself to continue to develop your personal growth at the same time that you 
you know, grow with your capabilities on the instrument. Um, in terms of finding your way back, boy, that's, that is, that is a really tough one. Cause again, it's, it's almost more, especially I found, I mean, the physical struggle is real. I mean, it was tough. I mean, it was yeah. physically painful for like eight years, literally. I mean, mm -hmm. and for the first three, four, five years of that, it was constant throbbing, unrelenting pain that, um, changed the way I even talk. I mean, I, I started talking out of like, you know, this side of my mouth, where I wasn't injured. I'd be like making M syllables, like off the, it was very strange. I would drink a soda bottle differently, shave differently. I was very sensitive about this part of my lip and all the facial movements that went along with it. It really, it affected me in, in a profoundly subtle and permanent kind of way. Um, the, the, the pain from when I first woke up to when I last fell asleep, any given day was that sort of constant psychological uh, pressure to to uh, remind me that things weren't right, things weren't normal. So there wasn't a lot of escape from it. So the only way that I found forward, because I, I lost about a year where I, I didn't really play. Um, and then I sort of slowly worked my way back into the orchestra. Um, but that first year back, remembering what I used to be able to do and then what I was capable of doing was probably the hardest thing, you know, because I felt like this part of me was just gone, you know? And again, if all you have for yourself is you're a trombone player and the sound you make and you lose it, then you don't got a lot left, you know? And so I, at the same time that I'm trying to find my trombone playing, I'm trying to find who the hell I am and who, who I was supposed to be. Hmm. So it's this sort of added, um, uh, uh, not, I don't know, burden's the right word, but added journey that I had to go on. Um, and so, yeah, trying to develop, first of all, could I come back? What were my goals going to be? And I had to really reevaluate what my goal was going to be. For, for a while, it was going to be like, I want to go out and play solos in uh, with orchestras in another country and travel the world and this, that, and the other. But it more became like, can I do this week? Can I get through this week? Can I play this one overture? Can I... Um, uh, can I play a high B flat? Can I play some long tones without pain? Um, what can I do to improve my strength? What do I need to do to change this, that, or the other and develop a, a, a routine that allowed me to rebuild my mechanics? So, you know, if you're, if you're injured, you know, um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things. So, I mean, first of all, you have to understand what your injury is. I think trying to find someone to medically diagnose you is really important. You know, there's all different manners in which we can become injured. You know, some of which are minor and you can sort of play your way through others, which I think you probably have to take some time off. Um, I think that that some people are more apt to run off to surgical uh, intervention before you really explore all your options. That's the one thing I keep thinking about is to don't 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 allow yourself to get surgery unless you literally can't play. I think that's my personal philosophy with that one. Um, uh and once you understand sort of the nature of your injury and you know that it's okay to, that there's enough muscle tissue surviving, you know that it's basically what's happened, then you can start to work your way back. But I think you have to let go of the expectation that your playing will be exactly the same as it was because it wasn't, it'll be something different. It doesn't mean that it can't be great, but you have to um, let go of the past and learn what the new future is. I mean, because if you went through a muscle tear like I did, then you, the musculature is not there. You have muscle memory that's attached to something that doesn't exist anymore. You can't dwell on that. You've got to be, uh, I wish I had learned earlier to let go of it and to expect a new way forward and to find a new way forward. Um, I think you have to be, uh, uh, you know, you focus your mechanics on just really like, what does it take to create a buzz? What does the embouchure look like? Don't demand too much of yourself too soon. Embrace the fact that you're not going to, probably play pain-free for some number of years. Most everyone I speak to, there's a pretty, uh, you know, two to three years is like your first threshold where the pain is much more manageable. Seven years is another sort of threshold where people really start to feel like the pain is kind of gone. A decade is like, you don't even really, I mean, I, I can't really remember what it was like to hurt like that anymore, but it, it's a, it's, it's a journey and a half. I mean, it's not a, most people who have some things, they can go on to wonderful, great careers, but you've got to sort of let go or embrace the the process and there's a lot more that i don't want to waste this entire thing on this but no worries, no worries. I've, I've 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 done some some interviews on this very specifically on the and the brass junkies uh podcast with with uh uh with andy hits and i've, I've done um uh, another thing if you go to the musicians well website uh that uh 
Angela Bilder has done that, that uh, there's an interview I did uh, that she did with me that's listed there that talks a lot about uh, some of the stuff that I went through. So uh, this, that's probably about as much as I can compress it down to, to give you some ideas about injuries. <laughs> and Steve, do you have anything to add to yeah. that? I mean, you. Well, you know, I remember seeing that. I mean, I, uh, it was, it was, uh, my, my heart was just broken for you, Colin, when you showed me a picture of what, of what had happened. And, uh, and it really got me to think, you know, um, oh my goodness, you know, this could happen. If it could happen to Colin, it could happen to anyone. And so, you know, these, these things happen, injuries happen. And, you know, how do we, how do we recover from them? And it got me thinking, and I think, you know, Colin, we, we, we talked, we talked a lot about this, you know, I'm sure, I mean, I, I couldn't help you, but, but I tried to be there for you. And, um, and sure enough, you know, I, I, you know, he's, he's helped me too, because I, I had my own thing. And, and 2012, I was playing the Creston and something gave out and it still hasn't recovered. Um, and it, you know, it, it's, it's never quite been the same. Um, and the thing that I've, I've had to deal with, or I've had to realize is that, just because, just because there is something there that's not quite. This is this is for me though. You know, uh, something wasn't quite right. But I don't need to focus all of my energy on this one little thing when I'm when no one can really totally tell that something has happened. That uh, you know, I could still play. It was, it was minor enough. You know, and I saw it. I I, I went out and tried to get some some ideas of what it is you know it is a neuro neuropathy of, of some sort uh but you know i wasn't going to breathe any differently i wasn't going to think any differently in terms of what i wanted to do in terms of the phrase it just was going to feel different and so through dealing with all those things i'm i was still able to, to make it through um my endurance isn't quite what it used to be uh the creston is not a piece i will pro probably play ever again <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay i've played it a couple times now and i'm good with it uh but um but yeah i mean um you know you look at you look at uh most musicians and i think i heard Correct me if I'm wrong, Colin, because I think you're you're a little bit more up on this than I am. But, you know, like 80 percent of orchestral musicians have some sort of injury throughout their career. And, you know, d there are all sorts of uh, uh, articles and um, resources available for those. And we're, we're learning more and more about what kinds of injur injuries could happen. How could we prevent them? Um, you know, could... Um, you know, at, at, at NEC, there's a there's a body mapping specialist. There's Alexander Technique specialists. You know, these these are the people who can help put you in the right place. And that's one of the things that we try we we've tried hard to do. Uh, you know, at school, you've seen you know you you've seen this. Um, and so, I think there is a definitely definitely more room for people like that. And I think trombonists should be thinking during their undergrad and master's years about how to, to create a better, uh, more efficient way of playing so that it doesn't do them harm later on in their career. Um, not that anything could have been done for you, Colin. I don't know. I, I you know, I think, you know, as we've, uh, as we've, uh, you know, I've, sure enough, I've got injuries. I've got a surgery on Friday for my shoulder, and that's just something that I'm just getting older now. And uh, it's a bone spur, and I'm going to have to deal with that. And uh, I'm about to embark on about, oh, probably at least a month of not playing. Mm. So that'll be interesting to go through a month of, you know, no playing. And what am I going to do? I, You know, honestly, I think, I think now after playing professionally for 20 years, uh, 21, 20, so I don't know. Math is not my strong suit, um, but it's somewhere around twenty, maybe twenty-one years. I, I might just take a break and just enjoy the break without, you know, guilt, you know, guilt-free break, and just let it just kind of okay. I'm gonna just hang out, let my shoulder heal, and uh, you know, and when the time is right, I'll come back. Um, so that that's kind of where I am on my journey. But I know, and I'm positive about this, when I come back, you know, the things that, you know, it might take me a while, but I feel very, very okay because 
I, like I said, I know how to breathe. You've got all these systems. You've got a system for breathing. You've got a system for standing. You've got a system for how you move your slide. You've, got, you've, you've mapped out what a great slur sounds like. You've mapped out, you know, what does a great musician do in this situation, in this situation, in this situation. All those things are still there. So for me, I've had to realize that just because I've had this one little one little thing that it's it's like uh, for me, it's like my uh, the left engine of an airplane has given out. <laughs> you know, that's that's what it is. I'm still flying, but it's sometimes I don't feel like, uh, you know, but but just because that's happening doesn't mean that I can't be uh, a great musician. And uh, so that's how I've dealt with it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and just make sure not to throw the, you know, the, you know, the baby out with the bathwater, you know, because all these other systems are still there, are still in place. And just like Colin said, it's just it's not going to make it just it's just something new. So that's how I've had to deal with my own my own stuff. Sorry to project. But there you oh, have great. it. No, this <laughs> is all good information. Yeah, all great information. All very good. Well, we're it's 525 now, and I think we have to wrap things up. Uh, for the time and everything. So we're going to move into our rapid fire section of the questioning <laughs> just to end with a nice crescendo, you know, no, no. and uh, so, okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to take Colin on this one and Brandon is going to take Steve yes. and it's, it's not symbolic in any way. It's just how we decided to do it. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm ready. Uh-oh. What you got? All right. So I will start, I guess. If you could eliminate or not play one orchestral piece, what would it be? Ooh, what do I want to get rid of? Like just any orchestral piece, huh? Yeah, never have to uh, play it again. Tchaikovsky, Romeo and Juliet. Okay. Oh. Wow. Surprising. I love that piece. <laughs> yeah. What are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> that piece is awesome. That is controversial, the, man. The, the symbols, come on. I live for the symbols. <laughs> Oh, it's too much. I can't take it anymore. Every time that comes along, I'm like, oh. <laughs> that is funny. Have you ever been on a percussion committee? That The symbol part for that is on. Mm-hmm. One time. Oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. Go. We're gonna oh, oh we're, we're alternating. Okay. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good. Mr. Lang, what's the weirdest thing you've seen in someone else's home? Whoa. Uh, <laughs> recently? Because I haven't been anywhere. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before, 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 uh, uh, um, nothing comes to mind on this one. I hate to say it. I'm, I'm blanking. In someone else's home. What's the weirdest thing in your home if you can't think of anything? Oh, me. Probably just Steve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Me, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and I think my whole family would agree uh, uh, to that one. Um, gosh, no, I, I'm drawing a blank on what's the weirdest thing? What's the weirdest thing I've seen in someone else's home? That's just, oh, gosh. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't have an answer for that. So I am so okay, sorry. No, I got no nothing. Worries, no I got worries. nothing. I'll Maybe answer like the last question if you want. room with a Wenger... All the, like yeah, it could practices. be it could be the weirdest thing in this house is is what people come in and they they see this uh, this whisper room that I have, um, which you know it's self preservation, man. This is this is you know we we call it we call it the uh, the you know we affectionately call it the the marriage saver here. And, uh, and now I've got two I've got two kids who play instruments and one of them plays trombone. So now it affectionately is called the the kid saver too, or the parent saver. So <laughs> nice. that's great. All right, Colin, favorite slide position and why really quick. Mm. Uh, so first position, just cause it's about the easiest. It's lazy, <laughs> laziness, right. pure laziness. <laughs> Plus it's, it's the only, it's, it's a nice, comfortable, it's very like compact. It's right in there. Mm. Not a lot of like really worrying about where it is. So first position is just very comfortable. All right. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Uh, Mr. Lang, what's your favorite childhood toy growing up? Oh, I had a, 
Well, I played a lot of sports, so I, I could, you know, my tennis racket was one of them or my baseball glove, if you call that a toy. If it's a, a real toy, I would say I had a handheld Hasbro football game and it was like little blips and I still have it. I could go downstairs and get it for you because I put a little sticker that says Steve on it. I'll put I'll I'll put it up on Facebook. But um, it's it's like uh, yeah, a little football game and and it had like little 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 blips. That's how old I am. <laughs> That's great. Oh my god! All right, Colin. Um, describe yourself as a teenager in three words. As a teenager, uh, oh my god! In three words. Uh, I'd say uh, <laughs> moody, obsessive, and fun. Nice. <laughs> it's a good combination. combination. All right. <laughs> uh, if you could take two animals and create one super animal, what two animals would you choose, Mr. Langley? <laughs> two animals, create them into... Well, this reminds me... Are we going South Park on this? Because uh, that's what I'm thinking about. Well, that's three we animals. Don't want, we oh, don't, uh, we don't want to go there. Oh, I, I, <laughs> we don't, we I, do I, not I didn't know go that there. was a South Park thing. No, no, I was just asking this question. <laughs> She's obviously it's a liger. Has anyone been watching the Netflix lately? Which one? Which li one? A liger. Liger. No. Dude, the, no. the, oh, the oh, lion, uh, lion and tiger, dude, you know? Oh, yeah, oh. that's right. Like, what's his name? Joe Exotic? He, was, he had a couple of ligers. Oh, yes. <laughs> did, you watch, did you watch that show that was the Tiger King? The I, tiger did, King. I did, I did. Oh man, I got through one episode and I'm like, no, no more. I mean, it was it was rough. <laughs> it's a little freaky. <laughs> For sure. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, a super. Okay, so I'd start with sloth because I love sloths. Um, sloth. What else is a is a great? What what is what is my other favorite animal? Um, ooh, maybe some sort of lizards. Maybe a slizzard. A, a sloth. And a lizard. Can you imagine a slizzard? Oh, because lizards are fast, but then the sloth would kind of make them a lot slower. And yeah, I don't know. I'd probably go with that. But cute face. Maybe keep it as a pet. <laughs> slizzard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sorry. Goodness. That's but, really lame. No, anyway. That's no, great. That's great. So for you, Colin, um, a simple question. Hot or cold? Mm, uh, hot. Yes, For a particular are. reason, just... <laughs> just cold sucks. I just realized what you said. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> what, did you say something that I, that I missed? What, what I, just I just agreed. Oh. Yeah. I just agreed. <laughs> it was Texas. Texas did it to you, right? Oh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, in Texas, then I lived in Atlanta for 12 years, too, so... <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hot Lanta. There you go. For sure. Uh Mr. Lang, what would you name your boat if you owned one? What would I name my what again? Boat if you owned one. My boat? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, I definitely don't own a boat. Um I own an inflatable boat actually. We took it out the other day. Um I'd probably go with some sort of like bone daddy reference uh the uss bone daddy how about that <laughs> <laughs> how's that that's great that's great <laughs> all right if uh mr williams if you could eliminate one alcoholic beverage from the face of the planet what would no. it be <laughs> no this, that's unfair you can't do that oh my god um so if, it, if i could get one to go it, it'd probably be like uh uh some of these like super sweet you know uh maybe uh mm. you're asking him all the easy questions i know I'm getting <laughs> right but i'll tell you you know what I, I take that back i take that back you know super nasty peaty scotches like a Laphroaig. I can't, I mean, that to me is just like, it's, it's too much. I would rather have like a super, like a daiquiri or something than, than drink a Laphroaig. And I like scotch, but like once we get past like a Lagavulin 16, then it's like, it's out of bounds for me. I can't take it. Oh, for me, it'd be Zima. I'm just putting that out there. No, <laughs> I forgot not doing, Zima. you can eliminate Zima. Good to go. Everything else. No. <laughs> do you guys, you guys don't even know what that is, do you? 
Oh my no, god. Well, gonna... yeah, look it up. Look it up. It's no All good. Right. See, there we go. I think there they still make it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, your favorite slide position on this wine. Oh, okay. Um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with fifth, and the reason for that is because there's something about D flat. I love D oh, flat. Oh, me too. Give me D flat every day. There's something yes. about trombone chord and D flat that just also. That's what I'll say about that. Awesome. Awesome. Nice. Of course, then the 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 third of the D flats and first, which then that agrees with Colin. And it can be nice. There and we go. You guys must play work well first. together then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, I, I have one more. Um, worst performance fail that you wish you could go back and correct. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> there's too many. There's too, there's too many for me, anyways. I don't know about for Colin, but for me, okay, so, we, so the, the, you'd have to have an, a whole other podcast for me at the, at the Hot Springs <laughs> Music Festival. Um, when I was in school. <laughs> was, was I there that particular summer? No, no, no. This is when I was, I was there. Oh. I think. Yeah, no. I was, I was, so I learned like when I was in uh, college, when I did, I performed like a Steve Rush Rebellion that you have to like scream into to the horn like as high a note as you can. I realized that I could sustain like a really great, like super E flat, like, you know, you know top of uh, octave above the top. Like for whatever reason, you scream in there, it makes my vocal cords activate. Um, uh, and we were playing a piece that Mike Forbes, the two player, had written, like a brass ensemble piece. And it ended on a big E flat major chord. And like we're just screwing around. It's like, all right, this is gonna be awesome, man. I'm gonna like end I'm gonna end here and it's like after we get there, we're gonna like I'm gonna use this thing and it's gonna be this great E flat. Well, we get to the end of this piece and I go for it, and it's like it's a total fail. It's like it's like it's like some D something. The chord sounds like really weird awful and it's kind of like hangs out there and i felt a little bad and then afterwards he comes up and says, man i was recording that to submit the composition to the like the you know to like the army or something for some for some <laughs> contest and now i now i've got this chord in there and i was like oh, oh no. <laughs> so I, I i felt bad about that because it was so unnecessary and so self-inflicted so if there's any one performance fail that i could take back that would be it okay I like How about that. you, Mr. Lang? Oh, for me, it's the first thing that came to mind amongst many performance fails. It seems like I have performance fails all the time, but um, was was not getting my clothes ready uh, for a gig of Mozart's Requiem. And I thought that the hall was open so I could get my tuxedo and everything, and it was closed. And the mm -hmm. church was right across the street from the hall so i just like oh, i'll just go to the hall and get my stuff you know and so it's like 30 minutes before the concert starts and i can't get my clothes and i can't go home to get anything else so i had jeans and a t-shirt so i played mozart's requiem i was the second trombone in jeans and a t-shirt <laughs> and it was the most embarrassing thing that ever happened because i remember thinking the entire <laughs> the entire the entire time it's like do i because at the end of this, at the end of this Mozart Requiem, I'm probably gonna get a bow for playing the solo, right? So, do I do I sabotage my solo so that I don't get a, a bow? <laughs> and I remember thinking, I I probably need to really screw this up so I don't get a bow, and. Um, yeah. So as it turned out, I don't I don't even remember how, but that's what I was worried about. They're so stupid. Did you? But get I played bow? it, and then I, and then of course he gave, he did give me a bow, and I stood up like, you know, I was just, oh, I was the worst. Oh my god, <laughs> worth it for the story. I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, well, yeah. I, don't, I, th I think we're all good now. That's that was really great. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah. For everything. No, kudos to you two for for putting together, uh, putting this together, and uh, fun to fun to connect with you again, Colin. Yeah, great to see you, man. <laughs> yeah, this has been really great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, Thank you, for... you very much to you both. All right. Awesome. Take All care. right. Easy. All right. And looking forward to working with you, Colin. <laughs> yeah. And thank we'll be you in so touch. much again for everything, Steve. Oh, you're so welcome. All right. All right, guys. All right. Thank Have you a great rest of your day. Thanks. Right. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. All right.